Hello, and welcome to the Whale Hunting Podcast, where we shine a light onto hidden worlds of money and power. I'm Bradley Hope, and this week I'm joined by Byron Tao, an investigative journalist covering the White House, national security, and law enforcement, and now author of the new book, Means of Control, How the Hidden Alliance of Tech and Government is Creating a New American Surveillance State. Welcome, Byron. Thanks for having me. It's always good to meet a former Wall Street Journal colleague. Do you have the same problem that I do where every time you go somewhere, you still still say we at the Wall Street Journal, you, you can't stop saying it? I'm glad to know that doesn't stop even years after you've left the paper. And yes, that is a, a constant issue. And in fact, I recently did a, a documentary where they identified me not by my current employer, but they said former reporter, Wall Street Journal. It kind of just sticks with you for life, I guess. Tell us about your new book, Means of Control, How the Hidden Alliance of Tech and Government is Creating a New American Surveillance State. Can you just tell us a bit about the book and how you came to write it in the first place? Sure. So at the highest levels, it's a story about how governments have increasingly turned towards opening their wallets to buy large amounts of data on the global population as a way to do mass surveillance. Uh, you know, this is different from the kinds of programs that Edward Snowden was describing, where, you know, you had secret courts and um, you had secret intercepts and you were hacking into computer systems. Those kind of surveillance programs are well known and well documented. But this was a phenomenon that I discovered while I was at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I got a tip sometime in 2018 that the Pentagon, through some contractors in the D.C. area, were buying large amounts of mobile advertising data. So basically things that came off of cell phones, digital ads, and uh, other, these sort of apps that people install on their phones, they all generate rich data sets. And there are data brokers that exist to collect that data and to vacuum it up and to sell it. And so the Pentagon was buying uh, through contractors large amounts of this data to do sort of military uh, targeting and intelligence. And as I dug deeper into it, I realized this was actually a, a pretty growing phenomenon as the amount of data in the world was increasing and as the um, number and richness of data sets available for sale was on the rise, governments were increasingly turning to buying data on the open market as, as buyers rather than hacking it or stealing it or sending a secret court order. And so I started delving into this world to try to better understand where the data comes from, who's using it, what they're using it for, and what the consequences are for our civil liberties and privacy and for civil society when this much data is available on everyone. It's actually a really fascinating topic, and I feel like in a way you're delving very deeply into this particular area where the government is the buyer. That's kind of a big part of your focus, but I, I also remember that there's lots of stories written over the years about how hedge funds are buying everyone's credit card data, that people are using even GPS data to figure out about sales trends at holiday weekends and trying to find other ways to predict the markets. I feel like the, the richness of data sets has really so many different use cases. Definitely. Um, so you know, a lot of the commercial data sets that I write about actually were legitimately created not for the government, but for the commercial market, right? To target advertising, to help guide investment decisions. In some cases, you can do analytics based on some of this stuff. So if you have a, a particularly rich data set on the movement of phones, you can use it to do things like decide where to put a Starbucks or another store based on how much foot traffic there is and based on how much car traffic there is. So there is uses for this data in the private sector. And that is largely what these brokers sprung up to cater to. Um, but of course, governments are also out there with a slightly different mission, a public safety mission, an intelligence mission, a military mission. And they have increasingly found that the exact same data sets that hedge fund analysts might use could also be potentially used for manhunting, for tracking, for mass surveillance, for understanding human networks. And, you know, if you're talking about this data from sort of a consumer privacy standpoint, I think what consumers are being told at the point of collection is that it's being collected for corporate purposes. But really, there are governments of all sizes and all kinds and, uh, you know, on a sort of spectrum from democracies like the United States or the UK to authoritarian countries, all lurking in these same markets and all participating and buying the same sort of data. And well, I have a lot of different questions about this. But is there an example that you came across of what looked like a very tame app or something like that, but actually found its way into 
a, a, a use case that is really just out of, out of control? Yeah. So the one that always stuck with me was this app that was formed on the University of Virginia campus by an undergraduate. It was originally called Drunk Mode, and it was basically a novelty app that would stop you from embarrassing yourselves when you've had too much to drink. And so there were all these silly features in there. You know, it would stop you from texting your ex. And, and there were some genuine safety features in there, right? There was an, a feature that let you keep track of your friends and make sure they got home safe. There was a feature that showed the guy to girl ratio at parties. So it was a combination of kind of undergraduate humor and a little bit of public safety aspect to it. You know, over time, the team that was developing it, they, they sort of became a legitimate company after the founder and a few other people graduated from college and they were trying to figure out how to monetize this thing. And they realized that the location data they were getting off the device was actually much more valuable than whatever they were trying to do to monetize it, whether it was charge 99 cents or put banner advertising in it. So they actually pivot to becoming much more of a location intelligence company. So their uh, aim was to go out there and help other apps that had sort of similar user bases uh, help them monetize their apps by buying the location data from them and put in, you know, developing a little piece of software that helped do that. Um, but, you know, as they started collecting a pretty rich data set on the world, they increasingly got drawn into the government space, right? So people approached them um, from uh, government contractors or people linked to government agencies and said, you know, you have a pretty interesting data set, you know, could we license it? Can we partner with you? The strangest aspect of this was that at one point, this government contractor came to them and they said, actually, the location data you have is pretty great, but we'd actually like to put a little snippet of code in your code that you have in, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of apps and millions of phones around the world that would actually use all these people's devices to scan the signal environment around the phone. So we want to scan all the Wi-Fi base stations. We want to look for various Bluetooth headphones. And, you know, what I came to find out was this was a government linked contractor that was sending a lot of this wireless data to government entities to a government intelligence program. I never quite figured out what they were doing with it, but I do sort of jokingly say in the book that this is essentially the weapon from the movie The Dark Knight, where they turn on um, everyone's cell phone in Gotham City emits like pulses and um, they locate the Joker through echolocation. And then Batman says, this is too powerful a weapon. We can never use it again. Um, they basically did that with Bluetooth devices and Bluetooth scanning. You know, it's just sort of the trajectory of many of these companies that they start out in the commercial market, they start out doing something pretty innocent or non nefarious. Uh, and then they get drawn into this murky world of data collection, data aggregation and government contracting in which there is money from powerful government entities out there and interest in doing stuff with this data. I feel like also what, what isn't apparent to the user of an app is the way that a potential buyer could blend a, a variety of data sets together, right? So if you wanted to follow somebody or tap their phone or whatever, there's all these legal processes, as you described. But if you wanted to find the same person using data sets that are very rich and even to some extent not anonymized, you, you could figure out that this person tends to go to Starbucks on a Monday morning at this place and, and just a couple of other data points and suddenly they have a kind of illuminated pathway of this person. Right. A lot of these companies are telling consumers when they, you know, click I accept on the terms of service that nobody even reads anyway, that the data that they're collecting is quote unquote anonymized. But when you're talking about a data set like geolocation, it's actually very difficult to anonymize it, right? Because I live uh, on Capitol Hill here in Washington, D.C. Two or three days a week, I, I ride my bike to my office in Georgetown. And I am the only, probably the only person in the entire world that has that geographic pattern of like waking up uh, with on this particular block and going to a particular block in Georgetown. So even if you've anonymized an entire a data set of the entire metropolitan region of Washington, you can probably find me if you know where I live. And that's not difficult. There are data brokers out there that have residential address information. If you know where I work, and that's pretty public off by LinkedIn. So when you combine things like open source information that people put out there about themselves on social media, with all the data sets that marketers collect on your addresses and your consumer preferences, and you marry that with rich data sets like, quote unquote, anonymized geolocation data, yeah, you can get a pretty darn rich picture of someone as they move around the world. That's amazing. I think 
you know, the, the hidden uses of data is something that people just have no everyday experience with. I, I remember I did a story at the journal once about this company called Yodly that, that, you know, when you go in your banking app, it had like a budgeting program, like how to make your budget for the month. In order to use that program, you sign a, you press a button that then gives them all this data about your spending. And um, Yodly at the time, the company, they were making like okay money from all that, but they had this super secret program where they were selling it to hedge funds for huge subscriptions. And I remember the reason that I wrote the story is somebody told me, oh yeah, Yodly moves the street. Every week, Yodly moves the street because they, they give you this batch of credit card data that gives you a signal for how certain consumer sensitive uh, firms are, are going to fare in the quarterly earnings. You, you think of your individual data as being not that big of a deal. Like, oh, I'm just going to the, from Starbucks to the office. But somebody else combining you with lots of other people is gleaning a lot of insights. I know there's been some cases where p people used data sets to figure out that there's a flurry of activity around two companies suggesting they might be merging, right? But I feel like what's ironic from about all this is that we hear all the time about like the danger of TikTok and China and, and how that's collecting all this data. We don't know what they're going to do with it. But it seems like maybe in America it's even worse in some ways. I mean, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that the American government's use of data is comparable to China. And certainly I'm not drawing any moral equivalent between the CCP and the U.S. government. But if you just want to talk about the amount of data that's sort of out there on either the average Chinese citizen or the average American citizen, they're probably somewhat similar. It's just that America hasn't taken the steps of sort of weaving all of the data that's in corporate data banks and government data banks together and pushing it down to the level of the local police. Whereas the Chinese have, have really moved to do that, especially in certain regions like Xinjiang, but even in sort of less restive regions of China, the same sort of data is being deployed in smart cities and all sorts of planning to try to make life frictionless for Chinese citizens. I think the thing about the United States is that it's recently anyway, where regulators have increasingly been... Um, scrutinizing some of this stuff, but it, it had been the Wild West for many, many years. Um, there were not a ton of rules about the collection and dissemination and use and reuse and adaptations of data. By and large, the U.S. Congress had not passed a comprehensive privacy law. And generally speaking, lawyers were blessing a lot of the acquisition and sale of this data based on 10, you know, a 50 page end user license agreement that nobody could reads and everyone just clicks I, I accept to. So really companies could get away with a lot. And then, you know, when it came to government programs, government lawyers would say, well, you know, people have opted in technically, right? They, they've chosen to share this data with corporations. And we're the government, you know, we have pretty um, serious counterterrorism missions. We have um, a public safety mission. We're trying to solve homicides here. Our mission is very important. Why, why can't we go out and obtain the same kind of data that um, hedge funds use to, to get market signals or that advertisers use to target people. And so that's how we've sort of ended up here is essentially there has not been a comprehensive privacy law in the United States that deals with the collection and transfer of, of data. And there haven't been the sort of statutory protections on collection and use of data by governments. And so it kind of is the Wild West. I guess in a way, everybody sort of understands how powerful data is because of that uncanny feeling you have about the ads that follow you around. Everyone has a story about how they were just talking about that with their friend and then suddenly there's an ad in their an Instagram or whatever. So I think that's probably the best testament to how powerful data is and how well we can be understood by just even using a few apps, right? It's figured out our age range, our interests. And I guess it's just a matter of how you look at it. I mean, it's the use case of the end user, the end buyer of the data. I mean, these are all, it's kind of, it's it's all fine to um, believe that the government has our best interests in mind, but it's kind of a lot of power to give them, like you said, with the Batman analogy. Yeah, and I think people have some vague notion that online advertising is creepy, but I don't think they quite understand how creepy it is. Essentially, when you load an app that has access to your geolocation, and there's a little banner ad in it. That ad is connected and served to you by an ad server of which there are thousands, if not even tens of thousands of parties 
um, participating in these instantaneous online auctions to try to serve you an ad. And the highest bidder wins, and it's all done by computers. But the problem is a really rich stream of data comes off of a device during this process, right? So if, if you've shared your geolocation with the app, if it's a weather app, the weather app passes your precise geolocation back to this ad exchange. It, it passes um, a unique identifier that either Apple or Google has assigned to your phone that's technically resettable, but no one even knows that it exists. So that's a unique identifier that can track you as you browse the web and, and move around and, and use different apps. All this weird technical information goes to these entities, and there are thousands of them, and some of them are sitting there saving this data and even if they're not winning the, the, the auction to serve you an ad, and there are real people at those companies that have access to the, that data, and they can start pouring through it, right? They can start separating out all the people where the data came from, say, Grindr, and then start running analytics on, on Grindr users based on their location and their proximity to other Grindr users. Some of this is technically contractually against the rules of the ad exchange, but there's very little ability to police it. And so there's a tremendously creepy amount of information that comes off of these ad exchanges that government contractors and even sometimes private um, investigators can use to determine a great deal of information about a person if they suddenly become of interest to some powerful entity. Are there any cases or, or examples where something bad happened with data like this? Like somebody accessed it inappropriately, use it for an illegal purpose, like or anything coming to mind? Yeah, so the the anecdote in my book that I think is the most interesting is about Grindr, actually. So as I just described, this entire ecosystem of online ads makes a lot of data available about app users to these ad exchanges. And Grindr was not selling data on its users in a traditional sense, right? It wasn't exactly that. It was that they had partnered with this digital advertising exchange and somebody on that exchange was saving a lot of the data and was brokering it. But as part of a counterintelligence demonstration, a government contractor had purchased a large amount of geolocation data, just stripped out the grinder data, and started drawing little geofences around the FBI building or the Pentagon or Fort Belvoir, where the NGA is, and, and just started seeing where those phones went after they left work and what other devices they were in proximity to and where they went. And, you know, they could see all sorts of interesting things, like where these people lived, that some of them were stopping at highway rest stops in the middle of the day on the route between two government facilities. There are all sorts of interesting and invasive information and inferences that they could draw from this data set. And in the exact same time period that this contractor was doing this, there was this another person that was walking around the world, and he seemed to be a Catholic activist who had access to this exact same data. He was out there describing himself as affiliated with some sort of national security program. And I know for a fact that national security entities were buying this data in this time period, and that there was a program running that had access to this grinder data. And he approached a bunch of Catholic uh, news agencies saying, I know how to find priests that are violating their vows. And eventually, a couple years later, one of them published research along those lines that showed that there was a priest, there was a high-level Catholic official who was using Grinder from Catholic facilities and acknowledged it and resigned from his office. So real consequences can be visited upon people based on these data sets. That's an amazing story. I think there's probably so many like that that we don't even know about yet. Um, what about Who's getting rich off of data? So the, is it is it diffuse or is there somebody that's sort of emerging as a central money making company around this kind of data? The market's pretty interesting because it's very fragmented. And um, I do think there are probably like, two, just take the market of location data. There are probably too many players in the location data market currently. Um, so it's probably due for some sort of consolidation. Um, but there's certainly money in it. Targeted advertising, geolocation, location insights is a multi-billion dollar industry. You know, targeted advertising itself, like if you're just talking about like the biggest ad firms targeting ads at people, I mean, that, that could almost be a trillion dollar industry. So there's a lot of of money in that kind of data. You know, the big biggest data brokers like your Thomson Reuters's and your Lexus Nexus's, those are fairly large companies and they're ones without a tremendous consumer facing presence. It's, they're not names that are uh, familiar to the average person around the world, but they're big companies that aggregate and collect and resell large amounts of data. 
But by and large, a lot of the companies I focus on are actually very small beltway contractors that exist primarily to cater to the government market. And they act as intermediaries between the commercial sources that have the data and the government entities that want the data. Oftentimes they build tools like visualization tools and other analytics tools that the government can use. Sometimes some of these contractors serve as just intermediaries for the acquisition of large amounts of raw data for the government. Sometimes some of these companies seem to exist just to put sort of a plausible commercial veneer on government data acquisition. So I found in one instance a giant defense contractor named Sierra Nevada, where if you go to their website, they have giant pictures of futuristic planes and orbiting satellite systems, and they do lots of cool defense stuff. But they set up a small marketing subsidiary called N context. And that subsidiary was acquiring large amounts of commercial consumer data and had described itself as just an ordinary marketing firm in the Virginia suburbs that worked for clients like a YMCA in New York or a Philadelphia cultural center. But really, they were a government contractor. And if you look in the government contracting database, they had all sorts of very interesting, mysterious contracts with intelligence community entities. And so it, it seemed from the outside to be something like a shell or a pass-through entity for the government to acquire large amounts of consumer data without it raising all that many eyebrows when they contract with a corporation. How aware are politicians about this this risk? I mean, prior to reading your book, of course, is, is this starting to spur any discussions around how to make changes? I mean, is there any real movement to protect people's data and their privacy to some extent? There is. So first of all, I think in the U.S., Congress and the Biden administration have woken up to the potential uses of data by adversary countries. So there is a ton of attention in the last few weeks on the acquisition of large amounts of data from China and other countries of concern like Russia and North Korea. There's an executive order that got signed a few weeks ago. Congress, I think, passed a bill, at least the House passed a bill unanimously, which is extremely rare that would essentially do the same thing as the executive order and really cut down on flows of Americans' data abroad to certain countries of concern. So all of a sudden, there's a ton of interest in the adversarial acquisition of data. And then on the civil liberties and privacy front in the United States, there's also been a fair amount of bipartisan interest in doing something about stopping the government from buying its way around our traditional constitutional protections. So, for example, there's this bill that was originally authored by Senator Ron Wyden called the Fourth Amendment is Not for Sale Act that would basically just stop government entities from buying data on American citizens. Of course, they can still go get a court order, they can get a warrant and acquire the data, but this would stop them from just sort of looking in bulk at the entire country. And that bill has actually drawn a fair amount of bipartisan interest. Now, there's certainly some lawmakers of both parties who have more traditionalist national security views and think it's not a, a great bill. But on the other hand, you know, there are very conservative Republicans and very liberal Democrats that have lined up behind it. So it will be a very interesting fight. They're trying currently to attach it to the reauthorization of our sort of landmark spy law that's due to expire next month. This sounds like a pretty tricky book to write in terms of the reporting. I mean, all the companies that are connected in some way to this collection of data, the purchase of it, the exploitation of it, none of them really want to talk about what's actually happening. How did you go about cracking this story? I'd love to hear a bit more about that. Yeah, so it's definitely true that neither the government agencies that were doing this, um, nor the contractors that are collecting this data, nor even the the, con- the data brokers that are legitimately in the commercial market, none of them really want to talk that much about it. Because I think for two reasons, um, on the consumer side, I think there is an acknowledgement that consumers do find large scale data collection um, sort of icky and kind of invasive, and they'd rather not draw a tremendous amount of attention to it. And on the government side, there's concern that if adversaries and criminals understood exactly how governments were acquiring large amounts of data, that they would change their behavior, they'd ditch their phone. So both are understandable in some ways. But you know, I, I, what drove me to write the book was I didn't think it was right in a democratic society for consumers in their role as purchasers of goods and technology and users of technology to be so in the dark about how data is collected and where it's going. And then as as voters and as part citizens of a democratic community, I didn't think it was 
right for governments to be using data in the shadows without sort of explaining to the population what it was doing with commercially acquired data. So luckily for me, most of these programs aren't classified, or if they are, they're classified at extremely low levels. Um, so it was possible to get former government officials to talk about it. There were contracting records, and it just took a lot of patiently and persistently going systematically through LinkedIn and other sources to try to find people willing to talk to me. You know, I got a lot of people that hung up on me. I got a lot of people that told me to go away. But eventually, if you do that for long enough, you will get a portrait of this world. And I guess the thing that also helps is that once you explain what it is you're trying to do, it does sound like a good idea to get to the bottom of it. There may be some people who thought it was very important for national security, but I think the average person can understand why it's also quite risky to have no control over this kind of data. I think that's true. And I think even a lot of national security officials express a lot of concern about the direction of data acquisition by governments. You know, a lot of them point the finger directly back at Silicon Valley and Madison Avenue, because as one of them told me in reporting this book, this entire world wasn't built by the government, right? The government didn't ask for backdoors into the ad networks. It didn't ask for a raw feed of so all social media sites or for there to be companies that existed to scrape it all. This is something that was built by the nation's largest consumer technology companies and by the nation's largest consumer advertising companies. And it's their world and the government is simply living in it, right? You know, one person said, you know, you're, everyone in the world is carrying around the world's greatest espionage device and it wasn't built by the government, right? It was built by private companies and we all shell out $1,000 every time we want a new one. And so that's really the crux of this story, that this is a world that was built sort of thoughtlessly by tech companies and advertisers and governments have just figured out clever ways to live in that world. It's enough to make you feel quite paranoid, but I guess... There is a sort of practical side to this sort of thing. Your last chapter is kind of a guide to how to protect yourself. I mean, what's your philosophy on protecting yourself? Is it like, what exactly are you going to achieve by really putting in all this work? And maybe you could give a few of your favorite tips that you, you'd like to tell, share with people. Yeah, so I'm a realist, so I do live in the real world. There are certain consumer technologies I really like. I'm wearing a fitness ring that reminds me, you know, not to drink three nights in a row because I'm destroying my body if I do that and will show me exactly just how much I'm destroying my body. I And I... I was talking to some special forces guys once and they're like, oh, you wrote this whole book about data and you got one of these, you know, aura rings or whatever. But so, uh, you know, I try to use technology mindfully with the awareness that you're never going to have perfect security, but there are certainly things you can do. So I worry a lot about the content of my communications. Um, so I try to use secure communications whenever possible. And there are excellent options. Apple's iMessage is end-to-end -end encrypted if you make some tweaks to some settings. Signal is sort of the gold standard of this. On the email side, there's plenty of providers like ProtonMail, and there, there are others out there. There's some encrypted drive providers or ways to make uh, something like Google Drive encrypted. And so I, I really worry about protecting my notes, protecting my communications, protecting my emails. I am quite careful about the permissions I give apps because you never really know what apps are doing with that data. So I try not to give apps access to my contact role. I try not to give them access to my photo roll. I do not give apps access to my geolocation unless I really trust them and only for short, brief periods of time. Like Apple has a, a clever setting where you can say like allow once or allow while using rather than anything having persistent 24-7 access to my geolocation. VPNs can be helpful. I mean, I think there is something of a debate in the privacy community because now you have to trust the VPN. And, but I think they can be helpful, if, especially if you're traveling to a, a, an authoritarian country and you're choosing a VPN in a rule of law country. I, I think that could offer you some protection. Um, and then just generally, I try to be kind of smart about it and mindful about it, right? I, I know that there's no perfect security, but, you know, I, I, I don't need to download this sketchy app. I don't need to give these things permissions. And so that's generally what I worry the most about is sort of not letting anything digitally track me around and not letting anything have access to communications and content. I think beyond that, and you have to really have a completely different lifestyle and I don't think most people are ready to give up the conveniences of technology to achieve that, you know? 
Yeah, and I don't think the average consumer sort of needs to have a Faraday bag at the ready at all times. But, you know, if, if they do want a little bit more privacy and security in their life, there are certainly things they can do that aren't that extreme and just involve tweaking a few settings and being a little bit more mindful about where they get their apps and information. And the final thing I guess I would say is I think the most important thing is that if people don't don't like this world of, of data collection, this sort of you are the product mentality, actually the best thing they can do is to pay money for services, right? Which is traditionally how capitalism worked for thousands of years, then we would see a lot less of this sort of sneakiness of app developers and services sort of monetizing their users because it's not free to make an app. It costs money. It costs money in coding talent. It costs money in server space. And you got to run payroll. None of this is free. And so consumers have too often begun to expect everything online to be free. And it's just not how it works. The economics of it do not work. And so if you are concerned about the direction of our technology and the ways in which corporations are monetizing you, the simple thing you can do is to give them money in exchange for a product that you like. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Byron, for stopping by. It's been really fascinating to hear about your new book. And I recommend everyone go out and take it, buy a copy. And if you have to, skip to the last chapter, get your tips for how to protect yourself. But thanks again for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for this week. Thanks to Byron for joining us. You can find Byron on Twitter. His handle is at Byron Tao, B-Y-R-O-N-T-A-U. And you can find Means of Control online and in all good bookshops. The best way to stay up to date with whale hunting is to hit follow wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can also subscribe to the Whale Hunting newsletter for updates on the shadowy lives of the powerful and ultra wealthy at whalehunting.projectbrazen.com. Thanks for listening. We'll be back next week for more. Whale Hunting is a production of Project Brazen. It's hosted by me, Tom Wright, and Bradley Hope. It's produced by Megan Dean and Claire Urban. At Project Brazen, Mariangel Gonzalez is our project manager and Megan Dean is network manager. Ryan Ho is the creative director with additional design from Andrea Claridge. For more from Whale Hunting and to subscribe to our newsletter, visit whalehunting.projectbrazen.com. Mm-hmm.